Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes, and with me today is M.J. Preston, author of the Highwayman series and the Equinox. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. So just, you know, as a quick intro, um, for those of us who haven't gotten a chance to read your series yet, give me a little background about your initial inspiration and just what the series is about. Okay, well, my initial inspiration is that way back when I used to be a serial killer. No, no. <laughs> Uh, my initial inspiration, uh, I don't know. Uh, I used to, I used to drive, uh, drive a lot in the United States, I used to drive a transport truck. So I ran a lot of the highways, uh, that are actually portrayed in, in these two books, Highwayman and then book four or four book two. <laughs> so I guess you could say that, but I've always had a fascination with the uh, police procedural with the chase, with the hunt, and, and of course, and even a little bit of true crime. And, and that's where I kind of switched gears. I mean, I had two books previous, which was uh, The Equinox and Acadia Event, and they were both horror, straight up horror novels. Mm -hmm. But I've always had a fascination because, the, you know, the, there are real monsters that walk among us, and that are these, these people, these predatory people that go yeah. out and hunt. A lot of them, too. <laughs> oh, there is. There's absolutely a lot of them. So that, I guess that would inspire it. I, you know, because I consider that, I mean, that's, I, they're, they're, uh, they're touting the books as, as horror. And I think there's horror elements, but I also think it's more of a, a thriller uh, series. And so that's, that's, I guess what inspired it. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I just started typing one day and said, oh boy, look what we got ourselves into. <laughs> Yeah, that that how it always happens with me too is I'll I'll start one thing and be like, oh, this is this is a standalone, and then like, you know, halfway through the book, I'm like, all right, so here's here's the outline for book one through six. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, a funny thing is is four four is my fourth novel, but four was actually supposed to be my second or third novel because at the same time I started four and and the first chapter of it I you know basically wrote two chapters for two books and one was four and the other one was mm -hmm. my second book a Katie event and uh it was a toss-up of which one I was going to write and so after you know I fell down on the side of a Katie event which was a ice road thriller uh science fiction horror mm -hmm. uh based on in the north uh that did okay and then um I was looking at where I started to write four again and all of a sudden somebody uh actually when i was out in new hampshire uh for the uh anthology conference i was sitting with a guy named philip perrin and he said to me you should write a throwaway <laughs> and i said what's a throwaway he says you know you write a little novella and you just give it away but it, mm -hmm. you use it to pump your book and i said hey that's a great idea i was thinking <laughs> beer at the time by the way all great ideas start that way <laughs> so i kind of put four down and uh, I thought, okay, I'll write this throwaway, and then I'll, what I'll do is I'll write it, and then I'm going to send it out uh, just after, uh, upon publication of four. And what happened is is that the throwaway turned into a novel, and that's the predecessor of four. And basically, these two books they're um, they're companion; they're they're one story. So you, you follow the story from the first book mm -hmm. on to the second book, and. That's that's how I guess it became a series. It wasn't intended to be, but all of a sudden I started looking at all these different characters in these two books and going, hmm, yeah, you know what? I could do a story about that. I could do a story about that. And so this is one tale between two books, but the the it, this tale concludes mm -hmm. at the end of the second book. And the idea is to write another book and you know, with this with characters drawn. Not all the same, but it's kind of cool because it's like a little melting pot and you can go oh okay i'm gonna draw this character and write a book about him right and put him on a case and stuff like that so i'm having a lot of fun with it uh early reviews i got two great reviews from the san francisco review of books mm -hmm. which i'm over the moon about and you know have to pop my head but uh you know that, that's that's basically it so as long as i'm alive and if, if i've got time to write i'm going to carry on with this but i also i'm a horror writer so i want to go back and write another juicy horror novel too yeah. so um, so, so tell me a little bit about the plot of of the first book. Obviously, no, no big spoilers. <laughs> sure. Yeah, the first now the first book, Highwayman, it's uh, about the rise of a serial killer. So, the Highwayman starts with a bar encounter where there's a young man at a bar, and he, and the bartender's there, and, and there's a young single mom, and she's tending bar, and they're, they're the only two that are in there, and he's been in a few nights, and they go home. He, you know, they they get a little chemistry, I guess, and they go home. Mm -hmm. and they have sex 
you know, like the, he, she, she takes him home and they, they have sex and whatnot. And you think, oh, this is kind of cool. Where is this going to go? And then he murders her son and her. Oh, geez. Yeah. It's, it's a very, uh, very, very vicious beginning to it. I mean, I'm not blow by blow, mm -hmm. but just enough. There's just enough that you see there that there's a dread. And um, from there, he evolves because he knows that this is his path. This is what he wants to do. And I think back to like a serial killer, like, well, Ted Bundy's probably the most famous serial killer in the United States. Right. There was a point in time in his life where he was killing women, but he was doing it, you know, erratically. He was still going to law school. He was trying to, to, to better his life. Right. And then there came a point where he just embraced what he was going to be. Mm -hmm. And all that other stuff started to fall by the wayside. And that's similar to what happens here. This is this guy's name. His name's Lance Bellinger. Mm -hmm. I initially started calling him a Lance Belanger, but everybody seems to call him Lance Bellinger. So we're going with Lance Bellinger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he turns around and uh, he, that's what he does. He says, you know what? I want to be the best serial killer out there. I want to be the most notorious. I want to have the most kills. And so in that first book, it's about his evolution. He does experiments on animals, figuring out how to incapacitate his victims. And then he starts flying all over the country and killing people and he stages them in a, by basically dismembering them and and putting their body parts in almost like if you were to lay out a starfish and cut it into five pieces right yeah so yeah he's got great visions of grandeur so <laughs> i mean it's it's good it's good to know your career path you know it's it's, it's important <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah well you got to give him it for dedication for sure right. the other half of the story is that he's being chased by an fbi agent who's facing retirement and um you know without going into too deep of detail but we, we have to understand that these these two books are the same story just we got to the certain point in the story and then we shut her down and now we've picked her up with the second book which is four mm -hmm. and uh so, and like i say they're they're companion books so yeah it's been a lot of fun uh, it's a lot of work and i've you know had a lot of help with uh, i have a research assistant and then of course we got mickey publicist out there you know pumping this and everything like that and it's uh it's so far out the gate we're we're i'm pretty happy with what's going on getting good reviews yeah I think um, it's interesting to sort of see where the serial killer um, genre, I guess, um, theme has has gone because I, I think we've gone from sort of this um, sort of the sensationalized, flashy, like more Dexter type show, which which is fun, you know, to something a little bit more like like you said, this dread and this slow building of like, so so where does this type of person come from? Um, my my husband and I are currently watching um, the fall, which I've seen before, but but he hasn't. And um, it it is so much of that like slow buildup of like so so where does this type of psychology come from? And I think that that's almost more fascinating than just the flashy um, you know blood splatter stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people have taken this in so many directions. I remember the probably the, well, I mean, I read, read Thomas Harris's. Uh, red dragon and the silence mm -hmm. of the lambs and you know harris went actually went to quantico and he hooked up with john douglas and robert wrestler i think john douglas who was you know kind of the, the those two guys are the guys that mind hunter are based on right. john douglas and robert wrestler and john douglas invited uh harris out to quantico so you got to hang out in behavioral sciences how cool is that just yeah. <laughs> i mean if, if that's your if that's your forte if you don't like to see terrible things right um but but i have a fascination with the whole idea of the hunting these guys and uh so we had that and then all of a sudden we transformed and yes like you said along came dexter where you got a sympathetic serial killer and this guy's going around and he's only killing the bad people once in a while he screws up and has to kill somebody else but what what my series is is i i wanted it to be as true to the true crime as maybe going back to south Lens, although right. uh harris really kind of made hannibal lecter an icon he didn't i don't think he intentionally did it mm -hmm. but you know Everybody kind of likes Hannibal Lecter, even though he eats people. That you kind of, there's a charm about him. He's a very charming gentleman. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted people not to like the guy in my book, this Lance Bellinger, and he is 
uh, he's a despicable human being mm -hmm. uh, at every level. He has no qualms about killing children. He has no qualms about killing uh, adults. He has no qualms about torturing animals. I mean, he, this really was kind of a drawing from all of the things that I've seen and read because most of these people, well, not most, 99.9% .9 with the exception of maybe the ones that are really mentally ill, like Jeffrey Dahmer, who ate people. Right. Um, they're disgusting, despicable human beings. Mm -hmm. They have no empathy. They're narcissistic. So I wanted to make sure that came across because otherwise it would have felt exploitive. And also I didn't want a Dexter type character. So I knew that I was going to take this, this serial killer from point A to point B, which would be two books. Mm -hmm. And then the next book is going to, you know, go back on the actual uh, protagonist who is uh, the, the FBI agents and, mm -hmm. and the, the police and all that. So. So you've, you've mentioned before, like you've, you've had a pretty varied um, career path um, with the, the trucking and then you were in the military and, and all sorts of stuff. And I always find, because we do a lot of driving and we're in a very isolated um, place most of the time when we're doing archaeology. And I find that it helps my writing so much, you know, because you're kind of stuck there with your thoughts. Um, but also there's the people watching aspect when you're on the road and when you're just encountering these people who are way out there and right um how how does that affect your writing and what what things have you been able to incorporate you know obviously your your initial inspiration but what other little things have you been able to incorporate into your work well i i mean like most writers i think um we're we're voyeurs at a heart so everything <laughs> we see we kind of absorb mm -hmm. so you know for instance i mean maybe you go you stop at a rest area and i'll tell you a little funny anecdote <laughs> and and this this is kind of the thing that does does inspire and that is where you draw from is i have a little i like to think i have a little filing cabinet in my head and i'll see you know, i'll see something unusual and then I'll, I'll just store it back there for later reference mm -hmm. i remember going uh i was in michigan and I stopped in a rest area, and it was a pretty seedy rest area. When I say seedy, it was just run down and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, because I was driving a truck, and I so I went in to use the restroom. I used the restroom, which was not a pleasant experience because it wasn't very well maintained. But they did have a restroom attendant in there. Mm -hmm. And anyhow, the mirrors on the walls were polished steel. They weren't. They weren't glass. They were polished steel. And the first thing that popped in my head is prison you know right you can smash the glass and you can as a as a weapon so i made a, <laughs> i made a comment while i was washing my hands and there was a there was a young man he was younger than i was but he was a little odd he could have probably auditioned for a, a sequel to uh deliverance mm -hmm. i mean he could right. he could have fit right in there he was very very uh and i and I'm, i don't mean to pick on this right. guy because i've never seen him again but he was very strange looking odd and he had red hair and uh -oh. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and he looked very rough around and uneducated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made a comment just off the top of my head. I said, Oh boy, look at these mirrors. I said, kind of reminds you of prison <laughs> as a joke. Oh boy. <laughs> and he came up and he waited and he was watching me and watching me. And then all of a sudden people walked away, you know, like going out, they'd done their business. Mm -hmm. And he walked up and he said, what were you in jail for? Oh boy. Anyway, <laughs> like he was sharing a secret right. with me and uh anyway so uh, the only thing i've ever been in jail for is when i was in my 20s i didn't pay a couple of tickets and i got put in like you know screen right. tickets stuff like that. um but so th things like that that's really mm -hmm. where i draw my inspiration from it's like buddy you're going into that filing cabinet yeah. and I'm gonna <laughs> for later and even if I don't write about you directly, and I never did, mm -hmm. uh, I might draw from what kind of a person you are or what I see and maybe build you into a different character. And I think that's basically the same thing when I, I went up and I ran the ice roads back in uh, between 2012 and 2016. Everything I saw, you know, just you just pluck it out. It's like, it, and that, that's, that's where the inspiration comes from, I think. And uh, I think that's where, you know, you, uh, that's where I draw my characters from. That and my wife's horrific nightmares that she has. And then she tells me about it. I was like, hey, that would be a great book. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it's it's always uh, interesting when your spouse wakes up screaming and you're like, so so tell me, tell me, what what was that one about? And they're like, is this is this therapy or are you just, you just mining me? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and it, it's it's funny because eh? like for people that don't really dig this stuff, and there are people. I mean, I got a friend that I know, and and he doesn't dig horror at all. Scares the crap out of him. He doesn't want anything to do with it. And they all look at you a little. They look at you a little different. Like really, man. Like I mean, I'm sure guys like Stephen King got this all the time too, where you know people think you're a little bit crazy. But I just I I really like playing around in that kind of ugly place because you get to make people do things that they wouldn't normally do in their life. And and you're basically as a writer, you're God over the story. Right. So you get to do those things, and you don't have to have any remorse about it. And I don't have aspirations of killing people. I mean, I like people. I haven't killed anybody, honestly. But, <laughs> um, you know, but I do love playing with in, in that region. But I was always just a huge fan of, or correction, a huge fan of horror and, and thriller and police procedural and all that. So I'm just kind of drawn to it. Yeah. I, I always get this sort of sense of, I guess, I guess honesty would be a good word when you put your characters in these really hard situations, you know, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm not always gravitating towards like grim, dark um, sci-fi fantasy my, myself. Cause I think that you need to balance it right. with, with hope. But I do think there is an honesty in those dark places. Um, and I think sometimes you get to know yourself a little bit better um, when, when you're facing those situations, even if it's just fiction, because you do get that chance of like, so what would I do if I were in this person's shoes? Well, yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think that um, I think maybe writing is a little bit of a therapy for the writer oh, for so sure. they don't go insane. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 when I wrote my first book, The Equinox, uh, one, of the, one of the parts in it was about a mother and father whose son had been murdered mm -hmm. and the struggles that they were going through, like that, you know, she was uh, highly medicated. This guy was going out of his mind, blaming himself. And you know, that's when you write something like that, what I, I like in my family, we, I lost a brother when he was seven years old oh, I'm sorry. and I saw how it affected my mother over the course of her life. And, you know, I didn't feel bad drawing from that. I didn't tell that story, but I used it in the writing of this book and it was a highly emotional thing. And it's weird because eh? you, and I don't want anybody else to hear this, but I mean, by the time I wrote it, it I was emotional. I mean, in tears, reading right. it back, you know, as I'm going, oh, okay, well. And so I think that's a way we get to go in and kind of tinker with ourselves as well. And mm -hmm. I and I also think that, you know, if you if you write more than, if you write a lot of stories, you don't even have to be a novel writer, but you, if you write a lot of stories, there's always a little, little piece of you in there somewhere. It, yeah. I mean, it's coming from your perspective, no matter what, but there's a little piece of you in there somewhere. So, and it could be something as mundane as uh, how, you know, you react to getting runny eggs one mm -hmm. day or something like that. But it also, I, I think that we're always kind of just reaching inside our own psyche and, and you know, and, and drawing comparisons with ourselves and some of our characters. For sure. I, some of them that we'd like to be, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, don't, don't have the opportunity to 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 be i think sometimes i think what's interesting about that i i had a character for like years uh, you know it was like one of the first books that i wrote so you know i, t I took my time with it and there was this one character who's one of the main characters i like just could not get her voice right i couldn't get into her head and right. all the other ones I, I had a fine time doing and it was like well you know is it is it because she's you know a bit a bit more feminine than me is it because like what like what's what's going on here and I finally had to sit down with myself and it's like, it's because she's facing things in her brain that you have in your brain that you're not ready to, to sit down and face yet, or, or you don't know how. And um, once I figured that out, you know, it was like these, these floodgates. Um, and, and now I know her so well, but it just, it took that like, no, it's not that you don't know her. It's that you know her and, and that's the problem. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes, that makes sense too. I mean, there, and sometimes we don't want to pick at those particular scabs, right. if you know, for lack of a better phrase. <laughs> and, and yeah, and I, I mean, I've, I've run down corridors with stories where, where you have a character and you're, you're like, ah, eh, crap, I don't like you. And, and then you got to back out and find a, a different way or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, but I, like I say, I, it's, it, it's all about your comfort level. I mean, writing about 
a guy that's uh, like i'm a huge animal lover i have right. two beagles and they're these two guys are the number three and number four i had two beagles before that and then i mm -hmm. had german shepherds I've, I've always loved animals i grew up around them and i was raised by somebody or by my mother who was a huge animal advocate and mm -hmm. even after she passed away we used to go to the spca and even if we weren't getting a dog we would stuff some money into the kitty in her name right uh, but the the fact of the matter is is in the books that i'm writing a lot of these guys that's where they stay they start with the most a uh, vulnerable victim that you can think of. So maybe it's a neighborhood cat, maybe it's a dog. And a lot of them sometimes, and then this is in all the research that I've done, a lot of them sometimes have, you know, started with children and then actually advanced. I believe in Rochester, New York, Arthur Shawcross, he was uh, a serial killer out there. He killed two children. He went to jail for like 10 years. They mm -hmm. let him out and then he started killing prostitutes. Right. So it's uh you know you're going to write about stuff like this and you and you think to yourself oh geez you know what are people going to think of me <laughs> writing writing because you're writing a fictional character so it's one thing to be a, a true crime writer like jack olson or something like that all you're doing is reporting the facts exactly but when you, you're creating characters like this yeah there's it's strange because you know the the biggest word i get is uh how do you think of this shit? That's what they say to me, right? Or, or, mm -hmm. or you know, are, are you just laying around all day thinking about killing people? Or, and my answer is usually, well, yes, I am. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. because I get, I don't get to do it in real life. So if I, you know, there's no more fun than that to to be a, a god over over a character because you can do whatever you want to them, and you can also make, uh, you know, they can persevere as well if you like the character. So right. I don't know, but sometimes you get those ones. I mean, I probably, I don't throw anything away in, in, in my, I've got lots of write, like, you know, I've got a folder writing mm -hmm. and I got stuff in there, you know, like where you get three pages in, you go, oh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working, right? Never mind. So, but I still hang on to it. It's weird because I can't let the shit go. I can't even let the edits go. Like, you know, when you, you write a book and then you polish it down to a certain point, maybe it starts out at 900 pages and you get her down to, you know, nicely condensed 600. Mm -hmm or 300 whatever um but i don't throw away all those other parts i take out i, I just can't i mean maybe i've got uh, some kind of a hoarding problem right. on my computer i don't know <laughs> i mean I, I i do the same thing i think because because sometimes especially when when it's a series you know and i apparently exclusively write series um I, you know I'll, yeah. I'll save those bits because it's like you know maybe that character's not doing that now and maybe you know she never will but if I can take those pieces, I can incorporate them into a different character. And, um, you know, or, or if it's just like a couple really awesome lines, it's like, man, I nailed that description, but now that place doesn't even exist anymore. I can take it yeah. and put it somewhere else. Well, that's what we all tell ourselves. but truth right. of the matter is we've got a hoarding problem. <laughs> so, no, I agree with you. I, and I, and I look at that too. I even, it, I, I agree. I think, I think that, yeah, we're always thinking, I'm going to hang on to this because it could be useful. It's like the the writing form of the guy that's got all the, you know, the plumbing fittings and crap in his garage that he's never going to use that are left over from whatever it was mm -hmm. that he built because he might need it or she might need it. Yeah. Uh, and I think with writing, it's the same thing. I mean, I don't know about you, but the desktop on my computer is just an absolute disaster. I've got <laughs> full, like, it's just... I remember when we first came out with computers, right? Or when they first mm -hmm. came out with the home computer, like, you know, the, uh, I guess, I can't remember. This, this was even before, or actually just when they came out with Windows 95. This right. was years and years ago. And I went over to a friend of mine and he was, uh, he, he was uh, an older fella, uh, but he used to write for me. Like I was, I was writing as an advocate for, for veterans at that time. I had a site, like a blog and whatnot. And he used to write, uh, military history for me and he sent it back to me now this guy was probably in his 70s but what got me was i went over and i looked at his desktop and it was just littered eh, with icons <laughs> say, internet explorer this that and the other oh, thing. No. <laughs> and i remember looking at it now i was probably 33 at the time and looking at it, i think oh my goodness look how messy this desktop is <laughs> but it was for him it was the convenience of being able to get online right mm -hmm. like oh okay listen i like this site so i'm going to put a link on my desktop uh I've become that guy. That's no. the problem. <laughs> so you know, you now I'm looking at my desktop. I'm going, oh my god, look at the mess. That's that's like, how my friend a is. Like, organized thing. <laughs> I I'm I'm the other end. I'm uh, like 
maybe neurotic would be the right term. Um, neurotically organized. I've I have a terabyte hard drive and oh, really? everything has its own folder. Everything has its own little like spot. I have like each book has like five different folders for the documents, the photos, the promo pictures, like everything. And my friend yeah. is like, I, I love her dearly, but she's like you and she has the desktop of doom. And I'm like, it just, just thinking about it makes me anxious. <laughs> well, I've see, I've got all the folders you're talking about. Like I have a writing folder. I have my publisher's folder. I have, uh, you know, my artwork folder, my, and I'm an amateur photographer, so I have mm -hmm. those folders. But it's still, I think my problem is, is when I save it, it's like, okay, you go, oh, okay, this is a, this is a really good ph photograph, right? Mm -hmm. I'm never going to find it if I put it into photographs, so I got to build a folder. So I'll, I'll put it in its own folder, and maybe I'll add two or three more pictures there, or same thing in written pieces. And the problem is, is that rather than having one folder that says writing, and then I've got everything, all other folders inside that are all organized, mm -hmm. mine are scattered to the wind all over my page because I think I won't find them again. I don't know. <laughs> oh, God. I, I didn't make my bed a lot when I was a kid. Right. So I think that's probably what yeah, that's, that's like the first thing I do when I get upset. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how type A I was until like, yeah. I, I got to be like closer to 30. And then I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like, type a boring neurotic okay this is interesting <laughs> well you're not alone i mean there's there are certain things that drive me crazy so you're how old you're 30 years old yeah, or, yeah. Oh, okay that's i guess it's not kind to ask no 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 i don't care i'm i'm so happy I, that i'm 30 now that i like i don't have to worry about anything i don't have to worry about like people caring what i'm doing or what i look like it's so freeing i love it <laughs> right well i mean and that's uh you know the that's a great, it is, I think that's a great age because I, I think I used to say this to my sons when they all hit their twenties, I said, Oh, you know, I wish I was 22 again. Mm -hmm. They go, Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I don't. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Cause back then when I was 22, I freaking knew everything. You know? <laughs> so that was a jab at that's them. That's true. But I think, I think 30 is when you kind of come as yourself. Like you, 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 nobody can call you a mouthy kid or anything anymore like that. You're an adult at that point. Right. You, you put your time in and whatnot. So. Yeah, yeah. And I'd love to be 30 again because I'm 55. And I, I, for me, I'd love to have that time again. That'd be cool. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just like, I'm so happy that like apparently the, the 30s are supposed to be some of your best years. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that. And I think because um, my, both my parents had me when they were older. So right. I, I sort of have a better idea of like, no, no, like you're still young when you're 40. You're still young when you're 50, you know, and, and I'm just sort of looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, that's what I've been saying all along. You know, like when I, I, I remember when I was in my 20s and I thought, when I hit 35, I'm going to be old, right? And then I hit my 30s. I said, you know what? When I hit 45, I'm going to be old. Then I hit my 40s. I went, you know what? When I hit the fifties, man, okay, that's officially old. <laughs> now I'm fifty. Now I'm fifty-five, and I'm going. You know what? Fifty-five is the new twenty-eight. Yep. <laughs> you know? I think what we realize as we age is that um, we're the same person we always were. I mean, we're more mature, and we've learned a lot of, of crap along the way. Mm -hmm. But when you when you're young and you look at older people, you go, "Holy cow! Look at the gray hair. Look at the you know, look at the etchings around the eyes. Look at the age." Mm -hmm. But what you don't realize is that's just exactly like you just another human being in there they've done all the things you did they you know they they maybe stole a chocolate bar when they were a kid out of a <laughs> something got caught or or they you know they did all these things and we tend we tend to forget that when we're young and then when we get up here we realize holy shit you know like i'm i'm a 14 year old trapped in the in the body of a 55 year old I, i'm still i'm still a kid at heart i i love i don't i don't play video games or anything like that but i am very much a kid at heart i love music i I like to clown around it and I've, you know, I, I still like to laugh and sometimes I like to laugh at toilet humor. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> I'm not a stuffy old white guy. So. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we always joke, like it's not, it's not the years it's, it's the mileage, but I think in a lot of ways, humans are a little bit like, um, alcohol in the that yeah. you know, you, you throw a bunch of, you know, shit in a bottle and it's like murky and kind of confusing and there's all these different ingredients and you probably don't know what half of them do and I mean I guess unless if you're a really good brewer but then by the end you know it's sort of been distilled it's been um you know filtered down to like the purest form of yourself and I think that's that's sort of what we are and I think that's sort of how we create our characters too is we're we're throwing a bunch of stuff in and then eventually you know halfway through the book we're like okay so so this is who you are this is who we are 
Yeah, I would tend to agree. I love the fact that you throw in the alcohol theme with writers too, because <laughs> I think we're tainted as alcoholic, neurotic, <laughs> whatever. Um, I always used to make jokes about that. I, I actually, you know, I used to kid around, well, I'm a writer, so I got to get pissed tonight, you know, like this. And and some people took it serious. But I, I, I do agree with you. I think that um, as we go on, it does become a little bit more nuanced what we do and, and how we conduct our lives as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and we don't have the energies or you have to learn to refocus your energies uh, to do a project like a novel or even just a short story because, you know, we've got all other things. I think we're we're better at it. But the one thing when I look back at my writing, um, going back to, say, the 1980s or even the late 70s, and it wasn't published at that time. I was just writing my ass off. You mm -hmm. know, and I wish I had the imaginative uh gray matter or you know i just i wish i'd had the imagination that i had then because i just came up with so many cool things even that that, that i could have worked on you know like hey let's have a crucifixion in the year 1999 right yeah <laughs> um um you know just but i mean i was really pushing out into all these places and a lot of it was from the things that i was seeing and learning uh, in the seventies, they you know they had a lot of dystopian apop apocalyptic movies mm -hmm. and, and and books and stuff like that. So you know you're reading all this stuff, and you're definitely you're influenced by it. Um, but I just love the that's one thing. Like I mean, I I have an imagination. Obviously, I've written four books, right. but I do I th I think that that is the purest form of that imagination is when you're that young, especially if you know you want to be a writer. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I I grew up as as an only child, and I had very few friends and. We lived in the woods, so like I had this, this isolation. I, know, I mean, I, I it was a great Were there childhood. Three college students <laughs> that came into the woods to a cabin. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Essentially, um, yeah. But yeah, we have such a capacity for imagination when we're younger because our brain hasn't found those like set pathways yet, and yeah, and I think maybe we're we're lucky being writers, you know, because we have to kind of constantly ask ourselves what if questions and I think a lot of people stop doing that and that's where the imagination comes from but we have so many more answers when we're younger because like if I mean for lack of a better term we don't know any better you know um or we don't know any worse right. maybe and yeah I, I just I think that trying to find ways to foster that imagination gets increasingly harder too as as you get older because like you know, life and, and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy. Um, we don't maybe have as much free yeah, time. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we become, uh, become more steadfast in our belief systems too. Mm -hmm. uh, like when you're young, you're, you, uh, you look around and, you know, uh, you're more idealistic. I think you, be, I, I think with everybody, a little bit of cynicism creeps in as you get older. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I, I, one thing I am finding now is because it, it, I think I kind of went through that stage when I was young, I was ideal, idealistic, you know, I voted liberal, I, and, and I'm, I'm not throwing politics out there, but I'm just using mm -hmm. this as an example. I looked at everything. I mean, a bully, you know, if I saw, if I saw a documentary about UFOs or Sasquatch, I was open-minded enough that I was like, Hey man, man maybe yeah. it's possible all this. And then as I got older, I started going, well, you know, I mean, look, there's phones everywhere. How come buddy, nobody's gotten a picture, a good mm -hmm. non-grainy picture of a UFO or a Sasquatch? But I also find that now I find I'm, I'm being more, even more, uh, I'm, I'm opening my eyes more to things now as I age. I, I think mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a former soldier. I had, uh, and I have a son who's in the military and I've, I've had a nephew and they've been to, you know, terrible places like Afghanistan right and when I was in the military and even after I got out I was steadfast you know we mm -hmm. got to go we got to do this we got to do that and then the perspective came when my son went to Afghanistan and um all of a sudden you started to rethink these things you know think you know what are we doing we're a bunch of old white men we're sending young people to war and I'm a former soldier I, have, mm -hmm. I mean I, I have a great love for the military um and that wouldn't have happened probably at the mid stage of my life in my, in my thirties and forties, Right, I would have been more steadfast. So I think, I think as you, I think it's a cycle thing and maybe it's not, maybe you just become a stuffy old person. <laughs> and you don't want to accept anything, Let's hope not. but I find that I'm now I'm being more critical of my own belief systems. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps you as a writer too, because it gets, 
if you just believe what's in box A all the time, then that, that's all you're going to know and it's all you're going to project. But if you look into box B, even if it's some stuff that you maybe don't agree with, you get to learn a, another perspective. One of the things that I, you know, you hear is a repeating theme uh, in politics mm -hmm. is when uh, a celebrity will get up and they'll say, well, you know, I think that the president is blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden there's this big movement and people say, well, you know, that stupid celebrity Hollywood person shouldn't be putting their opinion out there and blah, blah, blah. And I, and you know, some of them, they kind of annoy you when they do that. Like you get a celebrity gets up there and they really start stumping. And I mean, <laughs> some I've stopped watching their movies because it's like, Hey man, I want to watch your art. I don't care about what your, pol your political leanings are. Right. Mm -hmm. But it also raises the question is how come they don't get to have an opinion? They're, right. they're a person just like you. And then we all go run on our Facebook and we all go, <laughs> you know, crazy. Like, you know, uh, Trump sucks. No, Trump is awesome. No, Trump sucks like this. And, and then, you know, well, how come all of those people get to have an opinion on it? But some guy who, you know, is an artist and, and basically he's, he's successful. So he doesn't get to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So that's, I think in my thinking is I'm starting to look at things with more of a critical eye, but also is you need, I think we need to, we need to understand each other. And I know I'm getting mm -hmm. philosophical. No, 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 you're fine. That's my, good. <laughs> my catchphrase lately has been, we need to talk to each other, not about each other. Yeah. So even if somebody doesn't agree, for instance, uh, no matter what politician you're supporting, whether it's left, right, center, anarchist like that, you should still listen to the people with the dissenting point of view, or at least try to understand mm -hmm. why they have that dissenting point of view. And if we did that, I think we'd be a better, a better society for it. Well, I think just, just understanding each other, like what you said about the celebrities and I'm, I'm mostly thinking of, of actors, um, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways, I think actors are similar to writers because they have to get into all these different people's heads. So, yeah. you know, and, and obviously some of them are, you know, maybe a bit more ignorant of stuff and haven't had the same experiences and have a huge amount of privilege just because of their wealth. But I think you know, it, it is worth, like you said, just, just listening, being like, okay, that's, that's a, that's a thought. That's an interesting point. You know, maybe I don't agree. Maybe I do, but you know, just giving them a few seconds of bandwidth, you know, and, and obviously if, if it's not safe for someone to, to listen to, to that, like that's, that's another situation, but just, you know, if, if you can, if you have the bandwidth. Yeah. I think, I think that the only risk you run is, and I, and I say this as, you know, an artist as a, as a writer, mm -hmm. or but anybody that is in the art community is, if this is your passion, if you want to write books or you want to be in movies, you want to be an actor, you want to be a director, and that's your passion, you, the the issue with uh, the, the politics, if you bring po just bring politics into it, is that people stop forgetting that, hey, Sean Penn's a great writer, but boy, it sure does mouth off about George W. Bush. Right. Or... And, and I got to type in, like, I'm like anybody, I have opinions about stuff. I mean, I see what's going on in the world and some of it is a little bit scary. Um, but I'm learning fast and hard is that my readership is in both camps. It's in left and right camps. So do I want to poison that by, you know, talking down to whoever uh, online or not? And I, and I actually got, I got... Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of our prime minister up here in Canada because mm -hmm. I just think he's a fluff ball, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, but so I don't dis I don't agree with all his politics. I don't hate the man or anything like that. Um, and I remember going on to Twitter and, and, you know, making some comments because he was caught in a scandal where he tried to interfere in a criminal case because it would have adversely affected the votes in his riding, like right. for the election. And he got caught. And, uh, you know, it pissed me off because I'm kind of a rule of law person like that. Like, you, I don't like when politicians do that sort of stuff. So I, I said a few things and all of a sudden, you know, some of his hardcore supporters, which aren't on like, you know, the Make America Great Again guys, mm -hmm. uh, there's hardcore supporters in every camp. They started saying, hey, MJ Preston, he's an author. Don't buy his book. Yep. And that was an epiphany for me where I was like, you know what? I need to shut my trap about this crap. My opinion is my opinion. Uh, it's the same thing like religion. It's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to talk over a, uh, at the bar or whatnot, but the World Wide Web's a huge place. Mm -hmm. And I want 
people from both camps to read my books. That's why I'm putting these books out. I'm not putting them out for political reasons. So, mm -hmm. I guess maybe I'm I'm lucky because in in some ways um, because the majority of my characters are written for an audience who are you know like like myself like either queer or disabled or marginalized in some way. So right. when I you know I, I have the ability to share what is sort of a little bit more close to the heart, I guess, right. for me, because, because of my characters. But yeah, if, if I were writing a little bit more mainstream stuff, I think I would have to sit down with that and be like, okay, so how, <laughs> how do you want to use this platform and, and, and what matters to you? But, but for me, it's sort of like right. obvious. Tell me a little bit about what's, what's next for you and also where people can find you if they, you know, want to check out your awesome books now. Four is out and it, um, I've been really happy. The uh, San Francisco Review of Books has given both Highwayman and Four just huge thumbs up. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, Four uh, was released in uh, on the 25th of February and uh, in a Kindle, but it's now up in paperback. And I know they're doing production for the audio book right now because I've already heard the first 15 minutes of it. And I'm just off the charts about it. That's so exciting. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, writing... Writing a novel is a long, uh, grueling task. There's that initial out the gate where I'm brilliant. Oh, my God. And the story's unrolling and everything like that. And then by the time you get to it, the end of it, you've been through it, I don't know, 100 mm -hmm. times. And you've gone through it with editors and stuff like that. So uh, I'm very happy about that. So that's available on Amazon. All of my books are. I'm uh, mjpreston.net's the website if you want to come and check mm -hmm. me out. Um, you can go to the Wild Blue Press website. That's my publisher down there. Uh, they do a lot of true crime, but they also do, uh, they have horror and all sorts of cool stuff on their, their site. You should definitely go check them out. And that's basically, you can get me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If you're not a 19-year-old uh, girl in, in different stages of undress, <laughs> by all means, send me a friend request. Yeah, yeah I, I get um, all of the, like, 60 year old widowed military guys and i'm like i'm pretty sure you're a bot because i'm pretty sure you're not a fan but i, I mean <laughs> yeah it's strange yeah you go there and all of a sudden like i say and then you look at the person's page and they've got five right. pictures on there and there's no posting no nothing and you're going well, what am i getting set up <laughs> right like what what are you gonna spam me with but <laughs> um but I'm, I'm pretty open like i like i've got you know i've got a little bit of a fan base i'm not certainly not at the level of you know Stephen King or Robert McCammon or you know any other huge guy I'm not on the you know New York Times bestseller list but I one thing I like to do is I love to interact with people who read my work and so and you know if somebody reads something and they like it and they want to talk about it I'm I'm game for that like I'll I'll I'm not you know I'm not saying oh I don't want to talk mm -hmm. to you <laughs> well it's, it's great when you you know connect with someone and you you, you have like written this book and suddenly they get exactly what you were trying to do. And it's just, it's so fulfilling when you have those conversations. Well, and it gets you past that angsty thing as a writer too, because when you let, I, I think I made a analogy the other day. I said, when you let the book go, like it goes, you know, you're done all your stuff and you send mm -hmm. it out. It's like that little sea turtle that's running oh, towards God. the ocean and all the seagulls are up above circling around, right? Is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? Oh, he didn't make it. So uh, once you get that out there, if you get people that come back for me, but when somebody comes back to you and says, Hey man, or, you know, Hey, I really enjoyed your work. I mean, you know, how did you come up with this? How did you come up with that? That I, I dig that so much. I, I love, I love talking to people about that. And I love just talking about writing. I mean, I had a lot of fun today yeah. here with you because we, we didn't just talk about my work. Um, but what we, we did is we talked about general things and, and, I love sitting down and having conversations with other writers and doing that. So I really want to thank you for having me. No, that's, I mean, it's, it's been great. Well, this, this has been the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm B.S. Holmes. With me today was MJ Preston. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>